Good morning, friends, and welcome to Saudi United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Todd, and I am delighted to welcome you here on this, the most important day in the life of the church and the Christian, this Easter Sunday that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Today is April the 4th, 2021, and I am delighted to have you uh, watching this. Take a moment and refresh your coffee or your tea, whatever you might be enjoying this morning. Get your Bible out, and we will go ahead and jump right in. On this wonderful day of celebration and joy, we arrive at the final sermon in our Lenten series, Empire's End. Throughout Lent, we have explored some of the different empires that Jesus confronted during his earthly ministry. We have seen him defeat the empire of Satan, as well as the empire of death. We've seen him confront the empire of religious exclusiveness. And last Sunday, we saw him address the empire of allegiance. Monday, Thursday was a time to solemnly remember our Lord's final meal with his disciples, a kiss of betrayal from a friend, and Jesus' arrest and trial. Good Friday marked the final hours of Christ's life. His body was gently taken down from the blood-stained cross. It was wrapped in linen and placed in a borrowed tomb. Holy Saturday saw us without the presence of Christ, as his body lay in the darkness of the tomb. Turn with me, if you will, to our scripture reading. You will find it in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and we will begin with the first seven verses. When we started this series several weeks back, we imagined how the demons must have reacted when Jesus entered the Judean wilderness for his time of tempting. Oh great, here he comes, they may have said with some anxiety, because the demons immediately recognized who and what Jesus was. They knew from the outset who they were up against. Of course, Jesus rejected the temptations that were presented to him by Satan, And throughout his life and his ministry, Satan confronted him time and time again. And he was confounded by Jesus time and time again. So from Satan's perspective, the events of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday had to have been the ultimate triumph. He had gotten back at Jesus Satan had put an end to all the talk of messiahs and heavenly kingdoms and forgiveness and love and grace. Oh, great, here he comes, had given away to gotcha. We told you so. But what Satan did not know, but he was very soon to find out, was that there was still one more exclamation to come. It was the most important exclamation. It was the one that still rings throughout history. Oh no, he's back. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 28 beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and then sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened, they couldn't move. The angel spoke to the women. There is nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised just as he said. 
Come and look at the place where he was placed. Now, get on your way quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead. He is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. That's the message. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever stopped to notice how much fear is present in the resurrection narrative? The angel of the Lord descended in a brilliant light. He was accompanied by an earthquake. These were all symbols of God's presence and power and judgment. The angel removed the stone from the tomb. And Matthew tells us that the guards were scared to death. The Greek word that is translated here as scared means to be afraid of someone. These Roman guards, strong, battle-hardened, and certainly not the kind to be easily spooked, were suddenly overcome with great anxiety at the sight of the angel. They were so frightened they couldn't move. Some translations say that the guards became like dead men. Now please don't miss the irony that's being shown here. The ones who were assigned to guard a dead man now appear dead themselves, while the formerly dead man has been made alive. But there's more fear on hand. The angel spoke to the women. There is nothing to fear here. The Greek word that is translated in this statement as fear is phobeo. And it's a verb which means to generally be afraid of something. Our word phobia comes from this Greek root. The women were not so much afraid of the angel, although I'm sure there was quite a bit of that as well. They were afraid of this whole scene that was in front of them. Catatonic guards, an angel, glowing light, an earthquake, an open tomb. Of course, the women had nothing to actually fear. Yes, the situation was unprecedented, it was unusual, and it certainly caught them off guard and freaked them out. But the angel wanted them to know that their sudden anxiety was very temporary because I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised just as he said. Come and look at the place where he was placed. And then it says that their momentary fear gave way to deep wonder and joy. For the guards, however, their fear wasn't going away quite so easily. Let's pick up our reading in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 11. Meanwhile, the guards had scattered, but a few of them went into the city and told the high priests everything that had happened. They called a meeting of the religious leaders and came up with a plan. They took a large sum of money and gave it to the soldiers, bribing them to say, His disciples came in the night and stole the body while we were sleeping. They assured them, If the governor hears about your sleeping on duty, we will make sure you don't get blamed. The soldiers took the bribe and did as they were told. That story, cooked up by the Jewish high council, is still going around. Now, despite the fact that these soldiers were very likely veterans with decorated careers in the Roman legions, they ran from this scene like scalded dogs. Nothing in all their experience had prepared them for what happened that morning. A few of them, though, they got a grip on themselves They remembered their duty, 
and they went to the priests. The priests, in turn, called an emergency meeting of the key religious leaders and said, you know, we've got a problem. Now think about it for a moment. Jesus had been a burr under the saddle of the religious leaders ever since he started his ministry. He had challenged their interpretation and their application of the Hebrew Scriptures. He had condemned their false piety and their greed. He had threatened their prestige and their power. Now they were being told that this very man that they were responsible for having crucified was up and about? Can't you just imagine them looking at each other and saying, Oh no, he's back? So the religious leaders devised a scheme to cover up the events at the tomb. They took a large sum of money and gave it to the soldiers, bribing them to say, His disciples came in the night and stole the body while we were sleeping. The religious leaders even promised that they would cover for the (coughs) sleeping soldiers when they got in trouble with their commanding officer. But there's one other element of fear in the resurrection narrative that isn't explicitly recorded, but I believe it's there nonetheless. And that is the fear from Satan. The devil's celebration on Good Friday and on Holy Saturday dissolved into abject fear on Easter Sunday morning. Satan had thought he had won. He figured that he had accomplished the perfect plan against God. But with the first heartbeat of Jesus' body in that tomb, Satan knew ice-cold fear. Oh no, he's back. Satan knew that his perfect plan had not been so perfect. It hadn't worked. In fact, as we said a couple of weeks ago in our sermon series, the very thing that Satan had counted on to defeat Jesus, the cross, became the means by which God defeated Satan. You know, what if this day is full of joy and celebration as it is? What if this day was actually a fearful day for the empires of our world? What if the resurrection of Jesus wasn't just to give Christians hope for eternal life? What if it was also to serve notice to the empires of this world that continue to corrupt and keep people in bondage? Author Robin Myers, in his book, The Underground Church, imagines this kind of scene. This is what he writes. Instead of, he is risen... What if the world said, oh no, he's back? What if instead of angels singing, we heard multinational corporations groaning, slumlords fuming, payday loan crooks reeling? In short, all the Herods of the world muttering about how crucifixion just isn't what it used to be. You see... Easter Sunday is not the end of the story of Jesus. Sure, we we like to end it this way because, hey, it does make for a great ending. But Easter Sunday marks a new beginning for the followers of Jesus. All who claim Christ are empowered to carry on his mission in this world. Once there was one Jesus walking the roads, healing teaching, comforting, challenging. Now, there are millions of them walking the roads, healing, teaching, comforting, challenging. You know, we might be tempted to dust off our hands, maybe to breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, goodness gracious, Lent is over for another year and move on with our lives. But that 
is to rob the resurrection of its power and of its danger. When people think about Christianity, the image that comes to mind is this one right here behind me, the cross. That is the symbol that we gravitate toward. That is the symbol of our faith. You might be surprised to discover that the cross has not always been the main theme of Christians. Art historian Kenneth Clark says this about the cross. In the first century art of Christianity, the cross hardly appears. And the earliest example on the doors of Santa Sabina Church in Rome, dating from around 430 A.D., shows it stuck away in a corner, almost out of sight. Early Christian art is concerned with miracles, healings, and with the hopeful aspects of the faith like the ascension and the resurrection. So the main theme of the earliest Christian art was the resurrection of Jesus, not the cross. Now, of course, the cross was important, and it still is important. But the resurrection played a prominent role, and there's good reason for this. The resurrection is all about transformation. Whereas the cross is about something that was taken away, namely our sin and of course the life of Jesus. The cross represents what's taken away. But the resurrection points to something that God gives. New life and new hope. The transformation has to begin in the heart of each of us. And then we are to take that transformation out into the world and apply it to places of need and loss and desperation. The empires of this world that still exist due to human sinfulness, the empires that keep people beaten down and demoralized, they still need to be confronted and challenged. The resurrection of Jesus isn't just for us Christians any more than the church is just for us Christians. The resurrection is a signal to the world that Christ's followers have inherited his mantle and his mandate. The greed and the corruption in our world, the hate and the racism, the abuse and the deception, Everything that keeps people from living God-fulfilled lives should be on alert. On Easter Sunday, our greedy corporations and our lying politicians and our legalized loan sharks and our Wall Street speculators should be trembling in fear when Christians leave their churches. They should be saying, oh no, he's back, because we, his people, are a legitimate threat to the empires of this world. And the people around us every day, the poor and the needy, the homeless and the helpless, the orphan and the alien, the uninsured and the addict, you know what? They should be rejoicing when we leave our buildings on Easter Sunday morning. They should be praising God because His people are being released into the world with the good news. Is that what you plan to do after Easter Sunday? Do we intend to become the embodiment of Jesus Christ for the hurting around us? Are we willing to take up the crusade against the empires of this world like Jesus did? and help people out of darkness and into the light? Will the people around you this week say, oh no, Jesus is here because they encounter you? Let us pray. Today marks the holiest calendar on the, the holiest day on the church's calendar. 
It's the day when the people called Christians gather to celebrate the fact that death is not the end of the journey, that suffering does not last forever, and that the promises of God are reliable and trustworthy. From mountain villages in South America to the greatest cities of our world, from a humble chapel in the hills of Austria to the country church on a back road in Alabama, from house gatherings in China to soldiers deployed in the field, from the Gothic cathedrals of France to the slums of India, from Vatican to Venezuela, from Saudi Daisy to San Diego, millions of believers rejoice in this day above all others. God has given us transformation. It's his free gift to us if we will but reach out and accept it. He will shape us and he will fill us for the journey to which he calls every single one of us. Our individual paths come together in this gathering called church. Not so we can pat ourselves on the back for a good deed well endured, but so that we may stride forth in Christ's name and with the Spirit's power to change the world. Father above, let the sinful empires that still remain in our world tremble when we leave this place. Let them cry out in fear because Jesus is back, manifested in the love, grace, and service of his people. We're the people of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and made new through this day of resurrection. Thanks be to you, God of life, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose sacred and holy name we pray. Amen. My friends, thank you once again for joining me here. I pray that the rest of your Easter Sunday will be a tremendously blessed one. And we invite you to join us back again next Sunday. We will not be starting a new sermon series for a while. I don't have one planned uh, for uh, the, the next several weeks. I'm still working on some ideas. Uh, so next Sunday, we are going to take a look at a message called, Have You Argued With God Today? I think you might like it. Now will you receive this blessing and benediction. As you go into this week, be those who say, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He is risen. The tomb is empty because Jesus is out in the world, and now we must go join him in his work. May the joy and wonder of that first Easter morning live in your hearts as you depart to serve in his name. Amen.